Hey friend, this is Jennifer, and this is the Jennifer Allwood Show, the podcast for women who want to learn how to live an intentional life or build their creative business. I'll be giving you my very best business tips, bringing you interesting guests, giving you a daily dose of Jesus, and I'm committed to always keeping it real. Grab a cup of coffee and let's dive in. I'm so honored that you're here. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome back to the podcast this week. This week, I'm talking to um, a fun guest. This is going to be a fun topic. I hope that you guys will listen from the very beginning to end because I have Samantha Day, who's someone that's been in my coaching group. She is a certified sleep expert and she's on the podcast with me today. So what I love about what Samantha's doing is that not only is she a certified sleep expert and a learned behavior specialist, but she's super passionate about guiding families down the path of solid, healthy sleep. So she's really dedicated to helping families reach their sleep goals. So Samantha actually has a children's book getting ready to come out. Also, it's called Sleepy Susie. We're going to talk to her about that as well. But I just, I love the fact that she is a certified infant and sleep consultant for children and just smart as can be. So I'm super stoked to have her here with us today. Good morning, Miss Samantha. Good morning, Jennifer. How'd you sleep last night, girl? Did you sleep well? I slept well and so did my babies. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay, I'm really I was just I was telling you before we came on here. I'm excited to talk to you today for really selfish reasons and the It's because for the first time in my life, I am struggling, not falling to sleep, but staying asleep. So part of me is really selfish in that, oh, I can't wait to like ask her, you know, some specific questions about how I can actually stay asleep more. And I've never struggled with sleep, Samantha. So I'm going to pick your brain here at the end. But how does one even get started in sleep consulting? Can you tell us about that? Yes, absolutely. So honestly, I never thought that this was a path. It was never a goal. You know, oh, I want to be a sleep consultant when I'm older. It didn't didn't cross my mind. I actually knew I wanted to be a teacher and I went to school at um, Northern Illinois University to be a special ed teacher. So I got my degree as a learning behavior specialist and I worked in that area for a long time. Absolutely loved it. And then I decided to be a stay-at-home mom for a little while with my kids. So when my son was born about six and a half years ago, I stayed at home with him and he was not the best sleeper. And let me tell you, I love my sleep. So when that yes. happened, not only did that affect him, but it also affected the entire family. And so I felt how much that can affect the culture of your home. And what I did was after a while, after about five or six months of just sleepless nights, I decided to apply some of what I knew kind of behaviorally to what was going on with him. And I taught him how to sleep. And that's the thing is sleep really is a learned behavior. So I guided him down the path, taught him how to sleep. And within about two to three nights, he was sleeping through the night and the whole family was happier. And so that turned into friends saying, hey, help me. What what are you doing? Yes. And at that point, I helped them. And that turned into their friends and their friends. And so one day, my husband, who's super supportive for all of this, said, hey, this can be a thing. You love it. Look at, look how excited you get when another family is sleeping. Why don't you look into this? So I did. And I ended up going back to school and got certified in sleep and started my business, honestly, with the goal of helping one family here and one family there. But when you get one family to sleep, they tell all their friends yes. <laughs> and they tell yeah. all their friends. So the com- my, my business has grown in some really, really cool ways. But the most exciting thing is just seeing yeah. family. And you actually are able to consult with them uh, like over the interwebs. Am I right, Samantha? Like they don't have to come into an office in the city that you live in. Like you literally consult with them on the line. Isn't business in the year 2019 just fabulous? It's absolutely. I mean, who would have ever thunk this, you know, 10 years ago that you'd be able to like, you know, do what we do today in terms of consulting with and encouraging and teaching people in the online space. It's there. And literally there's no business that can't be online. That's what I love. I mean, how cool that you get to do sleep things online. So, well, I love what you are already talking about in terms of just the culture of the family. And um, as you know, we have a new four-year-old in the home and Ari has been with us for um, going on eight months now. And she did not come to us as a good sleeper. And it was funny, Samantha, because, you know, when a child comes from hard places, they come with all sorts of stuff with them. So not only was she not a good sleeper, but, you know, she also wasn't a great eater. And we also were dealing with tantrums and we're also dealing with, you know, normal four-year-old things, but then also a lot of additional baggage that came from just her coming from hard places. But it's funny because she didn't sleep well. And I can remember laying in bed the first week that we had her here, Samantha, and saying, okay, God, I can do this. 
I can, I can raise this girl as long as you let her sleep. I literally remember her saying that because I'm the same way. Girl, if I don't get me an eight to nine hours a night, I am a hot stinking mess. And so when she was waking up every couple hours, it took me right back, you know, to an infant. But now I'm, you know, looking down the barrel of turning 48. I don't have the same energy I did 20 years ago. And so I love that you're talking about the culture of the family because it really does affect everyone, doesn't it? Absolutely. And so many times when our kids aren't sleeping, especially for a new mom, we almost always say, oh my gosh, I'm so tired and I'm not getting sleep. And of course we feel that way, but all of us need that sleep. Our bodies are designed to sleep. The fun fact is that we can literally go longer without food and water than we can without sleep. We can go about a week without water, about three weeks without food, but the human body can only go about three to four days without sleep. We need it. So yes. when we're tired as, as adults, imagine yeah. what's going on with our kids. We can get up and grab a cup of coffee, or, yeah. you know, do what we need to do to make it through the day. But our babies, when they are tired, babies, children, you know, all the way up to teenage years, they actually look like they're wide awake. So yeah. To us, we're like, oh my gosh, they're waking up multiple times. They're even once a party at 2 a.m. because they don't look like they can go back to sleep when that's actually a sign that they're completely overtired. So we look like we're so, so, so tired when really realistically our children are just as tired, but they're yeah. different on them than it does on us. Yeah. So, okay. So the older kids, Samantha, we have a, a 17, 15 and 11 and mm-hmm. none of them were great sleepers. Like that's hard for me to say. And the reason it's hard for me to say is because I felt like such a failure. Like I was, mm-hmm. I read the books you know, that were available 17 and 15 years ago. I, um, the, in, you know, Google was not really a thing then. So it's not like I could Google. There wasn't social media where I could go find a sleep group. There certainly wasn't sleep consultants online like you. But I remember just feeling like other moms had their brand new babies, you know, sleeping through the night at a couple weeks old. And I was like, Noah was, I think, four months before he finally slept through the night. Easton was not quite a year. And Ava was after she was a year old, before she finally slept through the night. And I, the whole time I kept thinking, clearly I am doing something wrong that these kids do not sleep. And so you work a lot with new parents that are in similar situations, don't you? And so are there any like, just, you know, for a brand new mom who might have this podcast at right now, and perhaps she's sitting there folding laundry or nursing a baby as we speak, like, is there any tips you could give the brand new mother, like right out of the gate in terms of getting that child to sleep through the night as soon as possible? Yes. So my, that is my absolute favorite time to partner with families is when they're pregnant or when they first had a baby. Ooh, when they're pregnant. (laughs) That's smart, dude. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Because they're, and here's the thing is you can go to a bookstore and you can get a million books on sleep. Who has time for that? Yeah, exactly. You can Google all this information and so much of it is contradicting as well. So then you have a parent who's like, well, what do I do? This tells me to do this and this tells me to do that. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is really focus on research-based sleep information, what is actually true that's out there, and then focus on consistency. Okay. So often we do as parents, we read that one article and we try this, and then we read another article and we try that, right? There's all this kind of trial and error. But if we can focus on choosing one way of guiding our kiddos that Mm -hmm. that fits your family and your parenting style that we know we can stick with, that consistency is going to communicate really, really clearly with your little one. But it's when we get into the trial and error, like, okay, I'm going to try to nurse them. Well, that didn't work. Now I'm going to try to rock them. Well, that didn't work either. And all that trial and error often leads to a level of confusion with your little one that brings a little bit of anxiety, more tears for them trying to communicate with you and so on. So... I actually have an infant sleep series on my website that people can go to and it's, it's five videos long, takes less than an hour to watch. And it walks families through exactly what to do from the start. Best baby shower gift ever. By the okay. way. Yeah. Where, where can people find that at Samantha? Let's give that a shout out real quick and I'll put it in the show notes as well. Yeah. So it's samanthadayconsulting.com. Okay. Awesome. And on, under the immediate assistance tab is the infant sleep series. So I love that. that. That's like the 911 call, the immediate assistance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they get that, they can watch it completely and they know what to do. And there's big things like making sure a newborn has a big difference between daytime and nighttime, making sure that they're never overtired because when our kids are overtired, whether they're a newborn or a five-year-old, it's harder yes. to fall asleep and harder to stay asleep. So we have to look at their individual age and make uh-huh. sure that they're getting the right amount of sleep at the right times so that they can enter deep restorative sleep. And that's true for adults as well. Yeah. When we go to bed at, let's say, 10 o'clock at night versus one in the morning. 
you still close your eyes, you still fall asleep and sleep for a chunk of time, but not all of that sleep is created equal. So the depth of sleep you're getting at 10 o'clock at night versus at one o'clock in the morning is different. Mm -hmm. So we want to just focus on making sure we're getting the right amount of sleep at the right times for our age. I love that. So, um, I, I keep bringing this back to Ari, but it's because it's very fresh, you know, and uh, we're currently mm-hmm. walking through it. But um, after, you know, we had had her for a couple of weeks, we got her to a place where we were putting her to bed, just consistency, the same time every single night. And, um, and she began sleeping through the night, like every night. And now, you know, here we are almost eight months in and she's consistently every single night. But what we've noticed, Samantha, is we have to put her to bed pretty much the same time every evening. So that's 830 mm-hmm. as a four-year-old. I'd love to know if there's, you know, rules for what time we should get to bed. And she normally is up between seven or seven 30. But if we stretch that into, let's say, you know, it's a fun Saturday night and we have a house full of guests and she's like, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. And we let her to go to bed at 10 o'clock. Well, then you, she'll be up by six 30 to seven the next morning and kind of falling off the rails a little bit. And so just, you know, stretching her, letting her go an extra hour and a half actually ends up resulting in hurting us more because in our head, we're thinking, well, maybe if she stays up later, she'll sleep in a little bit more on a Sunday. Oh no, no, no. If anything, she's up earlier. Is that normal? Why do kids do that? You have got a million moms right now listening going, oh my gosh, me too. Because yes. So it's the science of how our body works. And when we're talking about kids, the later they go to bed, the more overtired they are. And when they're overtired, their body starts to overproduce cortisol, which is a stress hormone that we sometimes, Uh well, we always produce, sometimes overproduce. So when they go to sleep at that overtired level, their body is going to have trouble making it the same amount of time. So that's one reason um, that they start, that even though she's going to bed later, she's still waking up around the same time or earlier, which results in less overnight sleep completely, right? Yes. So that is that is normal that, that there's tons of parents who are agreeing and know that that happens. And that's why, unfortunately, the earlier bedtime is what we lean on for kids. Yes. So from birth, all the, well, from about four months to about five years old, eight o'clock is really the latest I like to see for most kiddos, although 8.30 is okay for a four-year-old. Okay. That kind of before eight o'clock is when we know that they can be going to bed at a really good level of tired that will assist them in reaching restorative deep sleep overnight. Hey there, business owners. I want to talk to some of you about SEO, especially for those of you who own a local business. Listen, if you have a business in your community, but people cannot find you, that is a serious problem. But there are seven ways to get your business seen by people, people who are searching for the best in a local area, and you can do it for free. My friend Kurt Frankenberg teaches business owners who are serving a local area how to dominate page one of Google and who does not want to be on page one of Google, right? So um, he has a guide. It's called Seven Hacks to get your local business a free front page listing. And he wants to give it to you guys. So don't overthink this. Just even, you can just even Google it. You can Google free front page listing and see how it pops up or go to Kurt's website at shoestring101.com. Do you have any tips, Samantha, for the fact that right now it's May in Kansas City and the birds are chirping and it's beautiful and, you know, we're nearing the end of the school year and it's light out until nine o'clock. So, you know, Ari's like, mom, I don't want to go to bed, you know, at 815 when we're trying. And by the way, what has worked really well with us, and I think that you'll give us um, a big high five for this, is we have to do the same thing every single night with her. So that means bath time, um, jammies. Then we're in bed and I have to tell her a story or read a book. It's her choice every night. Then we have to do prayers. Daddy has to pray over her. The dog has to be at the bottom of the bed, nightlight on, Mm -hmm. fan on. Uh, Like if we miss any one of those things, you know, and it might be just because she's got some special circumstances, but as long as we do all of those things, she will literally be asleep within five minutes, which is amazing. But she doesn't love the fact that it's still light out. So we did just put up um, curtains with a blackout effect on the back. So she can't, Mm -hmm. in her room, it looks dark, but she knows full good and well at the front of the house, it is still light. So do you have any suggestions for those of us moms who are, you know, fighting the fact that it's still nice out at 830 at night and she wants to be up? Absolutely. Especially with the summer coming and older kids are going to be out of school. I totally understand that. And first props to the bedtime routine. I, that's one of the biggest things is creating a routine that is very much the same every single night, whether you have a baby all the way up to a child. Okay. Because it communicates what's next and Uh it really kind of limits the negotiation. So for some families that like, 
One night they read one book and the next right night they read 10 books. There's so much difference and variation there that there's room for negotiation. Mommy, can I have one more book, please? Right. And so if it's just the same every night, it kind of takes away that, that negotiation or chance for that. Um, but one thing I, I suggest to parents is really changing the way that you're talking about bedtime. So often we say things like, well, the sun's up, so it's time to get up. Or you go, look, it's dark outside, it's time for bed. And we sometimes associate that, especially in the winter, to see it's dark out, it's time to go to sleep. But then the time changes or the sun starts. Yes. So we really want to change our language to focus on um, just saying like, look, it is seven o'clock or it is Mm -hmm. eight o'clock, it is time for bed. And really kind of giving them a warning of that as well. Okay, I'm going to set the timer. We have 10 more minutes until our bedtime routine starts so that they have that period of time to kind of understand that it's coming soon. And then their bedtime routine is going to start from there. But changing that language um, around sleep time can be really, really helpful. And avoiding saying things about the sun waking us up or the moon saying it's time for sleep. Okay. That the other thing really with the environment as well, I love that you have darkening shades, but we really want the environment to speak sleep. So darkening those shades as part of your bedtime routine so the sun is out mm-hmm. um, of the room is really, really important. Sunlight actually suppresses our natural production of melatonin for both adults and for kids. So for, you know, whoever's out there listening about this, the darker we can make it when we're sleeping, the, the better our melatonin levels will be and the more Ooh. we assist it um, when we're sleeping. So we definitely want it to be nice and dark after the four month mark all the way into adult. Okay. So that, that triggers me into thinking, cause I want to talk about teenagers next um, because we have two of them and we'll just consider Ava baby, almost a third, yeah. but our teenagers, their sleep routine is, is very, very different. And I'm sitting here thinking about how um, two of the three kids, their rooms are very dark. The third kiddo, he's like, mom, you know, I don't want curtains. I think he feels too cool for curtains. So his room is actually like, I think to myself, Samantha, how can he stay asleep on a Saturday morning when it's very bright in his room, but he's still sleeping. And so if I'm hearing you correctly, it would be very helpful, even though maybe his sleep isn't, he's still sleeping with the sun out. It sounds like just in terms of internally for melatonin levels, is that what I heard you say? Get him some darkening shades as well. Yes. And you know what? Teenagers have like magic sleeping dust that we wish. Gosh, can we like, could they package that and sell it. I mean, for real. Yes, exactly. Teenagers need about anywhere between eight and nine and a half, 10 hours of sleep a night, but they often get a lot more, but their whole internal clock sometimes shifts and they like to go to bed later and then sleep in, in the morning. Right. Uh, But yes, the darker we can make it for for them as well, the better, even though they can sleep when the light is in there, it just is better for that production in their body to be able to have it nice and dark. And the environment just says that it's time for sleep. Okay. So let me ask you a question about my teenagers and I'll try to keep this topic, um, you know, pertaining to sleep and not pertaining to the fact that I get so irritated with schools and sports. Okay. So let me, let me measure my words here, Samantha, but this is currently a normal day for, let's say one of my teenage boys. Um, one of them had to be up into school before 6am this morning for football practice. Um, even though, you know, football hasn't officially started, they have things they have to do for the sport. So he's getting up at five, five 15 in the morning and heading out the door. Now after school, he has track practice and or football exercises. Last night he was at the track working out. And so, you know, he's getting home at a reasonable hour. I'm telling everybody, you know, it's bedtime at 10, but he's, you know, on his phone, uh, doing whatever, watching Netflix till 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. And then, you know, turning right back around and being up at five. I know as his mom, this is not enough sleep. Number one, I, I can't as a 17 year old though, you know, force him to close his eyes. So I'd love your suggestions there. But what ends up happening, Samantha, is this is our week time routine, but then come Saturday and Sunday, he wants to sleep till, you know, 10, 11, 12, like to kind of catch up. And in my head, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I want him to catch up. Um, but I'd really rather he be getting those hours through the week. So how can a mom of teenagers help them to get sleep that's most beneficial for them? Yeah. So first, focus on conversations with them so that they understand what sleep's actually really going to do for their bodies, especially for athletes. Okay. So he's, you know, he plays sports and the amount of things that happen, muscle growth, um, strengthening their immune system, memory, uh, memory as well. I mean, the things that he's learning when he goes to practice, if he's mm-hmm. getting the right amount of sleep, his body can retain and remember. Even the muscle movements can be better if he's getting mm. the right amount of sleep. So really talking to him in a way that he's... I'm making him listen to this podcast, just so you know. 
I mean, athletes for sure need to be getting the right amount of sleep. So that's really, really important. But we want to say that wake up time in the morning is going to somewhat determine bedtime. Now, if he, we know he has to be up at six o'clock in the morning, you can say like, Hey, you got to be up early in the morning. What time do you think is a good time for you to go to sleep tonight? Mm -hmm. Right. And kind of have that conversation, let him make some of those choices too, but understanding the benefits that are going to come from it. Now, if he has to be, you know, up at six and we're Mm -hmm. wanting nine hours of sleep, we just rewind and see what time the best bedtime would be. But realistically, he's not going to be going to bed, you know, at 10 o'clock one night and one o'clock the next, there's going to be some variation. Right. So just having that healthy conversation and knowing the benefits of it and just guiding it the best that you can. But yeah, I don't love the 6am at school. I don't either. Well, and then if they have athletics or, you know, anything else after school, plus homework of any kind, I mean, it's, you know, they've got a full evening. And as a mom, it's real frustrating because, oh, by the way, when are we supposed to get in a family dinner? in there and I would just like him to fold his own laundry. So, you know, there's those things. Um, is it okay that on the weekends, uh, we let them sleep in? I know I was raised in a pretty strict household, Samantha. And so, you know, but it was also, I was a child of the seventies. So we, we didn't sleep in, you know, we were still up on the weekends. We were doing chores before school in the morning. I was either shoveling snow or every day I was unloading the dishwasher before school. I was not going to football practice. And so, you know, on the weekends though, we were still up with the family early doing things. And so is it okay that I'm letting my boys in particular sleep in until whenever they wake up on the weekend? I grew up in a house too, where we were up around 9 a.m. in the, in the weekend. So I totally understand that one. Yeah. Um, it is okay at this age, in teenage years, to let them sleep in. Okay. Within reason, we don't want them sleeping till one. And you even like, I can't, like, it, I can't even stay up till midnight, you know, on New Year's Eve anymore. I'm like, I can't even wrap my head around, you know, being up till one or two in the morning. But let's talk about grownups. Yes. And, um, and even, you know, grownups from the perspective of business, because a lot of our listeners are business owners. So in, in terms of like business owners, tell me why sleep is like so important or how being really well rested could benefit a business owner. Absolutely. I think teenagers have the ability, unlike the kids we were talking about, babies yes. where they're up at the same time, sure. teenagers can go to bed later and sleep later most of the time. But babies, young children, and then adults most of the time can't really do that as well as teenagers yeah. can. Again, they have that magic sleeping uh, dust over them. So yes, it's absolutely okay, okay within reason. We don't want them sleeping till one or two o'clock in the afternoon and then going to bed the next the next night. Right. Yes. Totally. So, yeah. Those little, you know, couple of hour variations are totally normal and okay. Totally okay. And then those teenagers. Can you even like, I can't, like, it, I can't even stay up till midnight, you know, on New Year's Eve anymore. I'm like, I can't even wrap my head around, you know, being up till one or two in the morning, but let's talk about grownups. Yes. And, um, and even, you know, grownups from the perspective of business, because a lot of our listeners are business owners. So in, in terms of like business owners, tell me why sleep is like so important or how being really well rested could benefit a business owner. Yeah, absolutely. So making sleep a priority is sometimes the bottom of the list for business owners. We have so many things that we're excited about that we want to, you know, work on and put out there. And this to-do list gets really long. And so sometimes we stay up late getting things done, or it's just not our main focus. So if somebody takes anything from this episode of your podcast, I would love for them just to see the importance of sleep and what that can do for their business. It does things like reduces stress. And think about how stressful our businesses can be sometimes. Sleep can literally reduce that for you. Again, we're talking about memory. It improves your memory. So things that you're learning that can relate to your business, you can actually retain to a deeper level if you're getting more sleep right? Yes. There's also studies that talk about it spiking your level of creativity. And so many people Ooh. that follow you are creative. Business. Yes. Somebody listen up. <laughs> yes. So when you're getting the right amount of sleep and you're improving that creativity and now you have the patience, which is another thing it improves to sit down and really, you know, put in your business, the amount of time you want to, and the amount of effort you want to, that sleep's going to improve all of that. Um, and back to that patience. So think about us when we are waking up multiple times at night and we wake mm-hmm. up in the morning and we are tired, we grab that coffee, right? Yeah. We probably have much less patience to deal with, you know, a problem with an employee or, you know, a problem with your email system that I just had yes. yesterday, right? There's all these things that pop up and your frustration level is going to be much higher when you don't, when you aren't as well rested as you could be. Another thing too, is your mood. So Getting enough sleep actually lowers our um, risk of depression. 
And it also increases our happiness and our mood. It makes us more positive, more determined, kind of regulates some, some different hormones that are within us, like our, you know, serotonin and our dopamine and all those different things. It regulates those. So our mood in general is going to be happier when we're getting the right amount of sleep. So, okay. So let's talk about the right amount of sleep for grownups because my right amount of sleep, like the, I feel best getting eight to nine hours of sleep a night. Maybe I'm just a prima donna. I don't know, but I feel like I need eight to nine to function at my best. My husband, on the other hand, he can go on five hours, six hours for him is about perfect. Um, and so, and, and I need naps, Samantha. And I'm like, what the heck is wrong with me? So tell me like, what is normal for a grown up? Is, is there a normal? Yeah. Well, there's a typical. Okay. So there's a range. um, And most parents or most adults need about seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Okay. Okay? So you're in that normal range. Okay. Fantastic. It's a little low. He's a little low on that. Five hours, definitely not enough. Um, Six hours. Okay. Even if he feels kind of rested in the morning, it still may not be the optimal level of sleep that he could be getting to improve all those things that we talked about. So Samantha, am I hearing you say that I'm right and he's wrong? Cause it, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Unless I miss it. Unless I meet him one day and then I'm never going to say Yes, it. exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we definitely, that seven to nine hour range is optimal for our body. But here's something to think about. A lot of adults that are getting that five, six hours of sleep over, overnight and feel rested not all, but some of them are in the sleep routine of, let's say, falling asleep on the couch for 30 minutes before they go to the bed and then continue yeah. the rest of their night of sleep. And that's just one example. But some, a lot of adults will grab our phone, right? And we're, we're scrolling and we're yes. playing and we're yes. doing whatever. And our sleep kind of routines are not as good as they used to be probably. Um, we have all these distractions. We fall asleep on the couch for 30 minutes and then we're startled awake or our partner wakes us up mm-hmm. and says, okay, come on, let's go to yes, bed. Yes. And then we do our whole bedtime routine. We sneak in bed and we try to fall asleep. And often it takes longer to return to sleep in your bed because you've already kind of entered a sleep cycle on the couch or wherever you fell asleep. Um, and the other thing is it's difficult for your body to enter the deep part of your sleep cycle in the beginning portion of the night, be woken up and interrupted go to your bed and get back into that same level of sleep. And so that often makes our nights a little bit shorter because they're not as restorative. Okay. So if to piggyback on that, just really focusing on having a really um, good routine associated with sleep. If you're falling asleep on the couch, say, okay, it's time for me to go and head upstairs and do your bedtime routine before you go to bed and allow that beginning portion of the night, the, those strong sleep mm-hmm. cycles that we go through between bedtime and about two to three o'clock in the morning, allow those to be as strong as possible and not have any disruptions or wakings um, in between. So I would love to chat about some of my personal sleep issues at the moment, because I've always prided myself in being a great sleeper. Like I would, you know, hear from other people that they're not sleeping well. And I'm like, dude, I do a lot of things bad, but I sleep good. Like I sleep well, I love a nap to the glory of God on the weekends and I have no issue sleeping. The last month I have actually started struggling a little bit. Part of it is, because okay, so first of all, I've been blaming it on menopause. Everybody that listens to this podcast knows that I've been menopause now for almost three years and I'll inevitably get an email and people will say, you can't be in menopause yet. Tell that to my ovaries and tell that to my menstrual cycle. Okay. I have knee deep, hopefully at the end of menopause, but, um, so I've been blaming it on that, but here's, here's what's happening inevitably because I am trying to do, uh, really take care of myself well. So that means eating better, which should make you sleep better, exercise more, which should make you sleep more and downing tons of water. Well, I end up having to pee in the middle of the night. I mean, I know that's too much information, but then I'm getting up and then I'm laying there for a hot minute and it's, I'm having a hard time getting back to sleep. And so where I used to just sleep like an angel, you know, from 11 o'clock at night, to seven o'clock in the morning. Now I'm waking up several times in the middle of the night, either they go to the restroom or just waking up and finding myself. It's not that I've got a lot on my mind or, you know, I'm not worrying about anything, but I'm just laying there thinking I'm tired. Why am I awake? Can you give any advice to that? And the other thing, the only thing I was thinking, Samantha, and I'm betting you're already going to talk about this is 
before I go to bed at night, number one, I have zero problems falling asleep. I'm asleep in 30 seconds, but I am usually on my electronic right before I go to bed. And I've been wondering, is that keeping me more wired than what I think it is? I don't know. Tell me, you're the expert here. Does everybody want to actually hear the answer to that? Oh, you know what? If it would help me sleep more soundly right now, I'm willing to make some changes because I feel frustrated about my sleep. Doesn't that sound lame? But, you know, for someone that's always slept so well to suddenly not be sleeping well, I'm like, this stinks. This is awful. I I hate that other people suffer from this. I don't want to do, you know, melatonin. I've tried like over-the-counter melatonin a couple of nights and it made me feel real racy in the middle of the night. Like, I dreamed really vivid. I didn't like how it made me feel. So I don't want to do that. And I don't drink caffeine before bed. And so I feel like if there's, you know, a couple of little tweaks that I could make, I'm absolutely willing to do that just to feel more rested when I get up. Absolutely. So the first thing you mentioned is technology. So some people are more sensitive to this than others. I definitely suggest that anyone under the age of five years old goes technology free for about an hour prior to sleep time. Okay. But for adults as well, especially with our phones, when it's right up close to us, yes. right, it actually stimulates the exact part of our brain that puts us to sleep. And again, you may be way more sensitive to it than you, than Ava or than Mr. Magic, right? And so everybody's a little bit different and it okay. kind of changes you as you get older as well, but you may be getting kind of stimulated in that part of the brain and having trouble entering that deep part of your sleep cycle at the start of the night. But the biggest thing is that I want to think about this as a puzzle. And it really is a, it's multiple different things that are going to equal you getting back to the point where you're sleeping really solid. There probably isn't one thing that's that's affecting this. Okay. So the technology piece definitely could be a part of it. And so you would suggest how, how long before bed should I turn that off? So 30 to 60 minutes would be ideal. Um, But nowadays there's so many different, you know, light changers on your phone where you can put on, you know, sleep mode and then the color of the screen changes and things like that. Those assist, but they don't always solve the problem. And so I would suggest probably at least 30 minutes before you go technology free. And is it the same when you say technology free, does that also include television? Because like Jason is not a slave to his phone at all. He just, he's not on social media. So he's not like checking Instagram before bed, but he does watch the news and then he watches Jimmy Fallon and then he watches whatever because he only needs two hours of sleep a night, you know, not, not, not literally, but you know, so (laughs) is it the same for TV or is it different for television? It is slightly different because different because of the distance of how far okay. it is away from you, but it is absolutely still the same in that it can stimulate that part of okay. the brain. Our okay. bodies look like they're calm and relaxing when we're watching yes. TV, but yeah. our brain is, is processing it in a different way. All okay. those different colors and, and music and all the things that you're seeing on TV change consistently can be stimulating. Okay. So yes, absolutely. But again, some people are more sensitive to that than others. Okay. My biggest thing about TV though is I suggest to get it out, have it off during sleep time. If it's in the bedroom, okay, that's a personal choice per family, but make sure that it's turned off. A lot of people fall asleep with the TV on and that does two things. First of all, the environment is always changing as you're sleeping, right? Commercial to TV to music, it's always changing. Mm -hmm. The light in the room is flashing as you're sleeping. So we don't really want any of that. Okay. Um, But it also eventually somewhere in the middle of the night, you're going to start going from the deep part of your sleep cycles into some of the lighter portions, maybe around 1am, 2am. And that's usually when you wake up and you go, oh, the TV's still on, right? And you turn the TV off. It pulls you out of your sleep cycle. And then we're not getting that solid sleep that we want overnight. So check now our TV before you kind of make a personal choice on that one, but definitely off as part of your bedtime routine and off throughout the night. Okay. What about reading a book right before bed? Awesome. Yes. Perfect. Really? Okay. Yes. Such a good way to just calm yourself to sleep. And because what you are, um, what you're processing in your brain right before you fall asleep is going to go right to that memory portion of your brain and you're going to retain it to a higher level. So what you're reading kind of in the middle of the day when you're distracted and you only get a minute here and a minute there, you're going to remember it. But if you're reading it right before you fall asleep, it soaks into a deeper level. um, And it's a great way to fall asleep as you're, as you're reading. Okay. So that's fascinating. My mother falls asleep every night reading a book. And so in my head, I guess I've always thought that as I'm reading right before bed, or if I read before bed, it's almost like a sleeping pill to me. And it makes me so tired. And I have always thought I'm probably not retaining anything because I'm just glazing over the words right now, but you're saying you actually will remember more 
what you yeah. read right before bed. Interesting. You may have to reread the parts that you were actually falling asleep. Okay. <laughs> the yes. The parts I'm drooling over. Yes. Yes, exactly. But it is a really good habit to get into and a relaxing um, part of a routine for a lot of people. Okay. How long before bed do I turn off the water so that I'm not up peeing a hundred times a night? Isn't that dumb? I'm like, what has happened to my bladder? Why have thou forsaken me? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Every, every bladder is different. So unfortunately there is no, I mean, I can okay. go all night long without it. Right. And I used to get mad when I was pregnant and I had to get up and pee. I'm like, yes. no, please just sleep. Yes. But there are other people that are up multiple times a night having to go. And that's really just a matter of that individual person. But I mean, probably right before you shouldn't have a full eight ounce glass of water. Sure. Right. Just so, so common that's, sense. That's really dependent on the individual person. Okay. Girl, this is fascinating. Like literally fascinating, the stuff that you're talking about. And a lot uh, of people don't realize all the positives. I mean, we, we think yeah. about sleep and we're like, yes, we need to rest our body. But when we really sit there and think about the assistance in having a healthy weight and lowering mm-hmm. depression, even yes. um, there's a connection between being sleep deprived and the, the rate of Alzheimer's. There, I mean, it's just, you can go really, really deep on the amount of things that happen when we're sleeping. And for our children, think about the behavior portion of it. When our kids are well-rested, they're, e- they're able to kind of reason to a yes. higher level, to understand what you're trying to get them to do behaviorally to a mm-hmm. higher level. But when they are tired, you are going to see way more meltdowns and yes. a really difficult time making it through the behavioral portions of a typical two-year-old, three-year-old, where if they are well-rested, it's going to be a lot easier. It's kind of a support to what you're trying to guide them through. So it's a win-win for everyone. But many families can't get to or don't know how to get to a point mm-hmm. where they reach their kids getting a full night's sleep. They feel stuck. They don't yes. know what to do. And I, I just, I love that you are helping families with this. I find it fascinating. And it makes me like, I literally was jotting down notes of things that I want to make sure that I talk to the family about um, just because I do want everybody performing and behaving at their best and, you know, and their bodies being as healthy as possible. So I want to talk just for a second about your children's book that's getting ready to come out. Yes. Okay. So I am really excited. There's a little backstory about it. In the beginning, before my business was online, and I used to meet with families, you know, at Starbucks or at their house, I would always bring a little present for the kiddo. And so there was a little girl. Her name was Ari, actually. Was it really? Yes, it was. And she's, she's older now, but I brought her a little stuffed animal. And to be totally honest, it was my daughter's that she never used. And I grabbed it. I'm like, okay, I'll give her this. So I walk into the meeting and I give her this little doll. And I said, you know, as one of the things we're talking about, this little girl loved dolls. Maybe you can give her this doll as part of your new bedtime routine to add some excitement and call her Sleepy Susie. And it was the first name that came to my head. And so it it turns out that Ari loved Sleepy Susie. And as a almost four-year-old, she sleeps with her every single night still. And so what happened was more and more families would come along and I would use this and say, hey, you know, you can always introduce a a comfort item and maybe name her Sleepy Susie or Sleepy Steve, depending on if it was a boy or a girl. So Sleepy Susie's kind of become a character amongst a lot of families that I've worked with. And so... The second part of this is I often read books with my kids. Of course, I have a four and a half year old and a six and a half year old. And there are so many sleep books that are out there. But unfortunately, a lot of them talk about being scared of the dark or monsters Mm. under the bed or not wanting to go to sleep. There's a book about, you know, I'm not, I'm not sleepy. I want one more book. I want one one more cup of water, whatever it is. And so I would be so frustrated reading these books, understanding that we're reading these to our kids before they go to sleep. Right. Yes. And so it was at that point that I decided that Sleepy Susie needed to really have a book. So we wrote, I wrote the book, found an illustrator and she has just finished the illustration. And um, it's all about how she loves sleep and how she has really good sleep habits and walks kids through being able to do that themselves. Um, And she also has a matching bedtime routine chart that parents are going to be able to download and print off and use. Um, at their house as well. So it's going to be available for purchase in about four weeks on Amazon, but they can always um, keep track on my Instagram or my Facebook and they'll see notifications for when it's ready. I love that so much. Girl, thank you for being here. Thank you. I love what you're doing. Yeah. Tell people how they can find you on social or if they are like, you know, 
what is what immediate, if immediate help needed with you, like if they want to book a time with you or um, how would they do that? How does one go about doing all the things with you? Yes. So my website is where you kind of figure out everything. And that's yes. samanthadayconsulting.com. And there's links to my Facebook and my Instagram, both Facebook and Instagram are Samantha Day Sleep Consulting. And on there, I do daily tips. I do free question and answers once a month where people can pop on to a Facebook live or an Instagram uh, live and I can answer questions that way. Um, and then I work one-on-one with families. There's typically a little bit of a wait for that, um, sure. but absolutely. So people can do calls with me. We can do full individualized sleep plans and things like that. And then under the immediate assistance tab, there are the four things. The one thing is naps on track, which is free talking specifically about naps. Yes. And then the other three are about different ages. So the one is for the pregnant moms and moms with babies up to three months old. And that just is establishing really good sleep habits. Yes. The next one is four months to four years. And that one's where all the marbles are teaching them how to fall asleep on their own, depending on your kind of parenting style, everything that we need to kind of get them out of your bed. If that's a goal, you know, wherever your goals are. And then the last one is called the toddler sleep series. And that one's for the transition out of the crib. Or if you're, you know, a four-year-old is climbing in your bed every night or waking up super early, that one's, that's for that. So tons of different ways to kind of get that assistance. um, And pretty much the website's the great way to do that. You're awesome. Samantha, thank you so much for being here. And friends, please go um, check out Samantha's social medias um, and grab that Sleepy Susie book when it comes out at the end of May. I'm super excited myself to get a copy. So Samantha, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. So friends, uh, appreciate you being here again this week, listening to the podcast. As always, if you get a chance, please go over to iTunes and leave us a review. And by the way, if you screenshot that review and send it to me um, through Instagram DMs, I will send you a private video just for you back within the same day. So do that for me. And Samantha and I both appreciate it. Thanks for being here. And until next week, stay creative. Bye-bye. Hey friend, thank you so much for listening to the podcast again this week. I'm so honored that you're here and that you just listen week in and week out and that you share the Jennifer Allwood show with your friends and family. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or if you're an Android user, go download the Stitcher app and you could subscribe there so that you know every single week when a new episode releases. Also, if you have any time to leave us a review, these reviews are super important in getting guests for the show and sponsors for the show. And so We'd appreciate it if you have just a second to leave us a review. That would be amazing. Thank you guys again for being here. And until next week, stay creative.